everyone. I would like to open this episode of The Swamp, which is our podcast that you're listening to. It's an acronym. Stands for some whack-ass movie podcasting. I'd like to start our episode off today with an anecdote. Emily, my co-host and I, Emily and I have been friends uh, since middle school. Yep. I used to dye my hair. I'm naturally a brunette, but I used to dye my hair a uh, bright fucking red, like fire truck red. Yep. And it was impressive. And one time... I distinctly remember I was 14 years old, we were freshmen in high school, and we were at your house, and your mom says to me, Dara, you really remind me of that girl from The Breakfast Club. And of course, me, with boxed red hair dye, and I'm like, she thinks I'm Molly Ringwald. That's such a compliment. And I was like, oh yeah? And she's like, no, 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 the other one. And I was like, well, yes, well, yes. Because honestly, I couldn't even clap back to that because she wasn't wrong. It's in the same vein that when people say that I look like Velma, and I'm like, hey, that's rude. But then I'm like wearing an orange turtleneck and I'm looking for my glasses on all fours on the ground. And I'm like, well, you got me. I'm like, well, well, yes. Uh, Me and Allison surely do share some similarities. I will give her that. So thank you, Jean, to clocking me from day one. I really appreciate it. Even though I was trying all my medicine to be a Claire, I was an Allison. So hey, sometimes there's just no, there's no hiding it. I feel like it's Uh, probably, you were like really big chunky sweaters and stuff like that you know and I was like, also, like definitely- doing weird shit and like kind of like running around like a muppet and like moving in odd ways and like you know eating pixie sticks on bread eating like a, a mm. whole bag of captain crunch like it's yeah. dog food for some yeah, reason of like course. do it like eating water bottle labels to get attention that was very my steez in the middle to early God, high school you ages did do so that, didn't you mm-hmm, yeah i related on the bad ways a little bit as well to her a little too much. Um, but I just yeah, thought that well, would be a nice way to open this episode. Yeah. I mean, the first time I met you, like, I don't know if I've told this story on here before. You certainly know it. But um, me and my sister, we didn't know your name yet. We all met in band and Alyssa played the um, the clarinet alongside you. Didn't know your name yet. We just called you Feather Girl because you had um, yeah. like just about 30 of those... <laughs> Like, I, it, it's it's very like strictly 2011 hyper um, hyper 2010 score not only was i wearing the feather earrings but i would diy use jewelry crimping beads not even beads for your hair beads for jewelry so that was like slicing into my scalp just dollar store fucking craft feathers getting it all up in there yeah it was truly impressive, but yeah, that's who you were to me for Other girl. probably a, yeah, a couple weeks. And then additionally, another anecdote is that I hate this movie. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know a lot of people like it, um, and I'm sorry as well that this episode's a little late this week because I am sick and I put on this movie and I thought to myself, boy, <laughs> do I really hate The Breakfast Club or am I about to be violently ill? Mm-hmm. And I was about 15 minutes in and I was like, no, it's just not sitting right with me. And I paused it and proceeded to become violently ill so mm-hmm. like my just fever just spiked the minute mm-hmm. i saw it directed by john hughes my body yeah. went nope and simply rejected this film so sorry we're yeah. a little late this week but i don't like the breakfast club i'm sorry uh, i know a lot of people do like it and i want to admit there are good things about this movie do, where's your standing i don't think you're as much of a hater as i am but do you love this no, no 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 i don't love it i definitely remember being probably like 12 or 13 and like my mom who is also a child of the 80s putting it on and being like this is a good movie because she yeah she's definitely got that john hughes nostalgia um and of course i adored it when i first watched it but i think through the years of seeing it on abc family every fucking week um chopped up and censored um has just really put me off to it and the amount of cultural references growing up with it it's just it was overbearing um and i think the movie's fine um i've got my qualms with it as well but i wouldn't say that i enjoy it i wouldn't say that i hate it it's just fine which i think is the most offensive thing in mm-hmm. my opinion because it's not like it at least if I had something to be mad about, that's giving me more than just, like, I'm kind of bored. Interesting. I'm mad. 
I'd be uh, mad. Enlighten me. I'd love to hear all about this because I you seem like you're not a John Hughes girl to begin with. Well, so that's what I kind of wanted to preface this episode with a little bit is I think historical context is a little important. I don't think the 80s were that long enough ago to like excuse certain things, right? Like other John Hughes movies are more problematic. Other John Hughes movies are less problematic. We can Mm -hmm. get into the nitty gritty. um, But ultimately, this movie tells me one thing. And I think John Hughes is a fucking incel. I think he doesn't like women. I don't think he knows how to write interesting women. And for some reason, he decided to be the voice of the weird, misunderstood teen girl in the 80s. Why did he make three back-to-back movies with a female protagonist that he's trying... Well, Breakfast Club, you know, mixed, mixed bag. But why are you trying to speak through Molly Ringwald, bro? Get the fuck out of here. But, you know... To give some good points, I wanted to say some things about this movie that I think are good because I understand Mm -hmm. why people like it. And I think within the context, there weren't really any movies about teenagers speaking to teenagers at that time or Mm. if they're they're very few and far between. It was very like speaking down to teens. And I think John Hughes really revolutionized validating teenagers feelings, which was sure its own, you know, new thing. So maybe they were willing to overlook some of the creepy, bad, uh, gross things in these movies because it's like, well, finally you're speaking to me and not at me. Right? I mean... It, whenever you get teenagers involved, it is sort of revolutionary. I mean, think of, like, teenage music wasn't made for teenagers before, like, you know, the Beatles and stuff mm-hmm. like that, you know? Um, and, I mean, teenage girls basically created fandoms in itself. Um, so I think when you do sort of start including them, it does become, like, a poignant, like, social um, period. And I think John Hughes specifically is not just focusing on teens, but he's also focusing on misunderstood teens or teens who are maybe a little socially marginalized, right? Don't feel like they fit in because that's relatable. Everyone can relate to somebody in the breakfast club in some way or another, right? Because they're all just laying all their shit out there. They're they're just laying all their shit out there. But I don't know. Is- I don't know if I could even pinpoint. Anyways. Sorry, yeah, we'll get into yeah. that. I don't, yeah, the relatability aspect, I think, gets a little construed yeah. as time passes. Sure. Yes, I think it's died off a bit more now. Mm-hmm. And I think we all have a much more open view of, like, the self, whereas this movie was very much, like, the good message of, you don't just have to be the one stereotype that everyone says you are. You can be a multidimensional human, even though you're 16 in high school. Mm-hmm. And actually talking and communicating with people who are different from you is a good thing. But... That is all within the confines of this movie that is so incredibly white, middle class, suburban. A lot of, of course, the issues of having a bad home life are important and good to bring up in media for people mm-hmm. who can relate to that. Yeah, but sure. All these kids are saying that their lives are so hard, and that is simply not very true in the context. You know, you think you just fall out of a coconut tree? Let's think about the context. And this movie is very white, very privileged. Yes, this movie is made. By white people for white people about white people. Mm-hmm. And you, interestingly, your partner was watching with you and they are not white and you said that they had never seen this before. And I kind of was like, oh, that mm-hmm. would make sense that not white people wouldn't be into this movie, like that their parents wouldn't have shown yeah. it to them because that's just like not part of the yeah. culture. Yeah, like they've seen every Fast and Furious movie with their father. Very <laughs> Breakfast Club, which honestly, <laughs> that could that could be better. <laughs> I, I, I think it is I think it is the better uh, scenario. And yeah, they thought it was dog shit for, you know, the 20 minutes they've spliced in and watched. So but my so that all aside. And of course, if you watch this movie at any sort of pivotal time in your adolescence or coming of age or whatever, I could see how this could be very impactful. Um, and I do remember not hating it the first time my mom showed it to me and she was like, this is very culturally significant. You should watch this. And I was like, yes, yeah. I understand. But with all John Hughes movies, there was something that just rubbed me the wrong way. I did not mm-hmm. enjoy Sixteen Candles. I did not enjoy Pretty in Pink. I don't like Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And going back even further, I don't think National Lampoon's Family Vacation is funny. I'll say it. Oh, that's him too? He Yeah, he wrote. John Hughes has written some raunchy shit. If you go back, some of the like short stories he used to write for like magazines and shit are like about incredible great lengths of sexual assault to a degree that is trying to be comedic that is very unfunny um john hughes hughes is a little questionable 
I don't but, doubt that. Especially, yeah, I mean, the blatant misogyny in this film was well, yes. in- insane. And so that was the first thing that, as a young person who saw this movie, that really set me off. That I was like, there must be a this didn't age well cultural divide between me and this film. Because what they did to my girl Allison was not okay. <laughs> and I was like, the one character who I can even see a little inkling of Mm -hmm. myself in, right? They just decimated my girl. They don't let her... She only squeaks and makes weird noises for the first half of the movie. When she speaks, she's saying all of this insane shit, and then she's like, just kidding, I'm a pathological liar, so don't trust me. So that all just sort of gets washed away. This sort of weird, vague dancing around of mental illness. They call her a basket case, but it's sort of like brushed as a joke some of the time. Like, she's so quirky. She's so quirked up. She's gonna... You know, oh, she fucked her therapist. That's so crazy oh yeah just kidding she didn't like that i did not like and then the final fucking blow is that he's like well what can two women do they can't speak to each other they can have a makeover scene though exactly Uh, these two girls don't develop they don't speak to each other once the whole fucking movie and then she's like let me do your mascara bitch and she's like why are you being nice that that line why are you being nice to me because you're letting me made me jump through my ceiling Mm -hmm. so ridiculous And of course, then the only way she gets the attention of the boy is because she now is wearing a headband and took off her makeup that she clearly likes and identifies with and Mm -hmm. just changes her entire personality and and persona um, for the attention of others. And that's how the movie ends, as if that that is a good thing. Yeah, well, it's the same thing. It's the same thing with Claire, who is bullied well, yes. and harassed by um, was it Bender the entire movie. And then all of a sudden, um, at the end, she's decided that, oh, wait, I find him charming in that rugged, like, piece of shit kind of way. That's really hot. Um, and they end up kind of... Um, Having a moment? Yeah, having a moment. She gives him her diamond earring. Like, it's... All, like where where does that come from like you can have like an understanding and empathy of like who a person is and where they come from without like it be having to become romantic for no reason and i wonder if this is sort of where those shitty ass like just tossed in romantic subplots really originated i mean i can say for myself i probably haven't watched a whole lot of movies earlier than like the 60s or 70s or anything like that but like the 80s really seemed to be that place where the sugar coating came about well especially stuff that's targeted to teens because they're like what do teens want teens are horny make them make them kiss put the boy put the two boys and the two girls together and the the nerd can go do everyone's homework uh and that's what the teens want right No, and this watch around, I was really trying to focus on those two couples, right? Anything Mm -hmm. throughout the movie that would ever indicate to me that these two people have chemistry and like each other and have a potential. There's not a lot. And every time there is something, this movie does this thing that really pisses me off. And I think it, I don't have any factual claims to back this up. Thank God, because this (laughs) podcast is about our fucking opinions. But I think that this movie maybe was part of a catalyst in tipping that people think that having a quote unquote deep conversation with someone just means trauma dumping, right? Oh, I don't want to talk about surface level bullshit. Let's have a real conversation. No, that just means that is a red flag to me that you just want to trauma dump, right? And this movie is. 90 minutes of trauma dumping. Every single one of these kids is like, let me tell you about my relationship with my dad. No, no, it's my turn. I want to tell you about my relationship with my dad. <laughs> and it's fine. They all can find a, kind of find a common ground. Well, I mean, well, hey, because there's nothing else for white kids in the 80s to complain about. Exactly. And they, they smoke some weed and they all relate to each other. And that's really beautiful, I guess. But I find <laughs> that I'm like, where are the moments where they are like realizing like, hey, maybe we could be friends. Hey, Claire, maybe it's good that you are talking to somebody who comes from a different background from you and you could learn something <laughs> from them. But instead, it's just him berating her and harassing her her crying and then at the end she gives a little look like but maybe i could like it you know mm-hmm. which is awful an awful yeah. thing to teach any young girl also weird judd mm-hmm. nelson is 26 
Uh, fucking Molly Ringwald was 16, was 16 when they filmed this, so not cool. He also, I think, was really mean to her on set because he wanted her as a person to dislike him so that their uh, dynamic on camera would be more believable and more tumultuous. But I'm like, you were just bullying a child. Like, <sighs> come on, grow the fuck up. You're you're bullying a 16-year-old girl because you thought it for your art or whatever. Like, yeah, nobody method acts because they want to be nice, right? Who said that? Exactly. Robert no. Pattinson, love that. Sure, something like that, yeah. But I just think that this movie's very trauma dumpy heavy where I'm like some of these things could have been actual interesting conversations between these characters, Mm -hmm. specifically the moments that could be romantic. The one I found the most is um, Emilio Estevez's character, Andrew. He is talking Mm -hmm. to uh, Allison, the weird girl. Right. And he's he's like, hey, how is your home life is bad. Right. And she yeah. like she like kind of nods, and he kind of connects with her. But then oh, they, I like this scene. But they actually, always yeah. they always do this shit though, where then they're like, "Well, now let's say the quiet part out loud." And he's like, "Oh, so you dumped out your purse for attention, huh?" I'm like, "You didn't have to say that. That we could through filmmaking and interesting storytelling, we could find out that you <sighs> then put those pieces together, and then you talk to her to be like." I want to be here for you. I'm, I also maybe don't have a satisfying home life. Let's, you don't have to, you know, maybe it's because they're teenagers well, and because I'm, I've matured, but every situation is like, and now I'm addressing the problem loudly. And I'm like, that's not how you. Well, to be fair, no, to be fair, this was made for teenagers who maybe don't have, you know, mm-hmm. that critical thinking skill. Maybe this is 25 year old me sort of projecting onto that but i always felt like those little moments could have could have turned romantic or even just some sort of connection between two unlikely people but then Mm -hmm. it always kind of turned a little sour or mean because then it was Mm -hmm. like oh you did that for attention (laughs) haha you're weird or between claire and bender right where he's like maybe i understand you she's like maybe i understand Mm -hmm. you but then oh let's stick it with an insult at the end to be like yeah that's the reason you're fucked up (laughs) isn't that relatable i didn't like that (laughs) Yeah, the scene, the scene where she goes and she puts the lipstick on by, like, putting it in between her boobs mm-hmm. and all that, that one always stuck out to me as really unnecessary because I think that there's a lot of scenes where Clara does some, you know, um, like, thoughtless, um, entitled shit that I'm like, okay, I can at least understand Bender coming after her a little bit on this. This one was just so fucking mean for no reason. After they were all just like sharing stuff they can do, and she's like, "No, I don't wanna." And then she put like just so like shitty and cruel, which like I it, the the whole point of it I think is for everyone else to call him out and like stand up for her, which they've been doing the entire movie though, so it doesn't make it any more impactful. It's just ugh. I don't know. I also sort of, this watch around, did a bit of a a reading as I was watching it of, like, picking up that everyone kind of wants to fuck Bender. They all hate him, right? And he's an asshole. And he's He's bullying. He's bullying the shit out of everyone. Yet, they all really want his respect. And they all continue to follow him and do everything he says and all that. But specifically, not just on a power dynamic level, that, of course, all teenagers want a little bit of the the bad Mm -hmm. side, a little bit of the, you know, standing up against the man and doing whatever the fuck I want. Like, there's a little bit of that in everyone, even the Bryans, even the Andrews, Mm -hmm. you know, of the world. But the thing that kind of stuck out to me for some reason was, like, there was all this, like, low-level sexual tension. Specifically, there's this one scene where we're kind of still getting introduced to the characters at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to recap the summary of The Breakfast Club because there's literally no plot. It's just five characters. They're in Sunday school, Saturday school together because they all did something different. They all represent different archetypes. I wish it was Sunday school. Sunday school. (laughs) I wish there was a hot nun there to beat Bender with a ruler. To beat 27-year-old Judd Nelson to death with a ruler. I don't know if he's a bad person or not. I don't know anything about him personally. But, um... But he lights, like, the tip of his shoe on fire yeah. and then, like, lights uh-huh. a cigarette inside with the tip of his uh-huh. boot, which is admittedly kind of hot. And he's just, like, fucking, he's dripped out. Like, he's wearing... I'll, gi- I'll give it to him. Listen, I, I'll i give it to him. I would have given it up. Yeah. Oh, yes, Easily. of course. Yes, and. Yeah. Uh, but they then, like, pan to everyone else and Claire gives a, a cheeky little, like, I'm too good for this, but underneath, maybe I could be into it, which is what we get throughout... Which is what we get kind of throughout the film anyways. But then Uh it goes to, like, uh, Anthony Michael Hall's character, who, like, 
pops a boner and then like puts something in his lap to like conceal his boner and i'm like that simply uh-huh. could not be referring to anything other than that we're all looking at judd nelson right and and, and it goes through and andrew's like side-eyeing a little bit and so is allison mm-hmm. but it was but i'm like oh i'm like they all do want to have sex with him like that's a part that i didn't pick up on before because i was mm-hmm. so focused on being pissed about the the Claire the Claire Bender yeah. relationship that they end up sort of together uh-huh. or whatever, and the thing about the end that pisses me off is he's like, "Well, your parents use you to get back at each other, so don't you want to use me?" Isn't that mm-hmm. decimating the entire point of the two of you finally understanding that you can be equals, right? That just because you come from different circles or different backgrounds, that the two of you can connect as humans, right? Isn't that the point of the movie? Uh No. He's like, you should use me as a pawn and do something shitty. We should continue this shitty behavior, shouldn't we? Shouldn't we both just continue to be shitty to everyone in our lives? Like, Mm -hmm. no, nobody learns anything here. No. Did we as an audience even learn anything? Which, Which, to be fair, they are idiot teens, so like, again... I think that tracks. That's not a teen. That's an adult man. Hello, Jen. You are here to do your interim podcast segment, Chocolate or Vanilla. But before we get into the regular decision-making game, I did have a couple of questions for you. So Jen is my mother, and I'm not going to steal your wallet and say your date of birth, address, and social security number for everyone. But I am going to say that you are the general right age, that you were like the prime demographic when this movie came out, correct? This is true. What year did it come out, by the way? 1985. Okay, yeah, I was a junior in high school. Perfect. Yeah, so, like, literally, you were in the marketing room, like, on a yeah. piece of paper, and they're like, how do we get this girl to watch this movie, Yeah, Jen was one of the yeah. first like, screeners. <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> and so I just had a couple of questions for you as I was watching this movie that I'm like, truly the 80s was not that long ago as I have direct access to talk to somebody who lived through it and has vivid memories of it, right? So this movie in general, what was kind of the general reception? Like, did people go ape shit for this? <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like it might be one of those that came became a cult classic after mm. the fact. Oh, okay. Because yeah. I honestly don't remember like i remember going to see star wars i remember going to see close encounters i remember other movies coming out but like i don't remember it being that big a deal Hmm. interesting yeah but i do remember in college like it's a go-to like halloween costume and like Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so a little later would you say the same thing of other john hughes movies of like pretty in pink and 16 candles like kind of sleeper hits at the beginning that then became the hype yeah it's probably the 80s nostalgia right yeah okay exactly. okay mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. then my second question which if you weren't in on the hype you know when it first came out i don't know how your perception of this would be but i was just curious did like young women generally find emilio estevez in this movie to be like sexually viable were girls go for sexually viable are you a computer <laughs> <laughs> I just was he hot? Like, I just don't see it. Was he yeah. hot? Because well, he's hot in Mighty Ducks. He's not hot in this. Mm, I have never seen the Mighty Ducks, so yeah. he's he's never hot. Um, <laughs> never hot. <laughs> God, he looks just like his father. But uh, I no, I thought that was miscast. Like, yeah. Do you I think didn't... he was the character was supposed to be hot, and that guy is just. He exudes cop energy. There's just something ultimately not hot about a fucking narc. Well, he looks like he's 40 years old. He was probably, he wasn't more than 25, I don't think. He was 23. When the movie came out, so he's probably 22 when they filmed. Yeah, he looks like he's 40 years old. Mm -hmm. As opposed to uh, Judd Nelson, who was 40 years old. (laughs) No, just kidding. He's 26, but but that he he looks 40-40. It almost distracted from Emilio Estevez's 40 because of Judd Nelson was (laughs) so 40. Yeah. I feel like um, I appreciated the stereotypes, but I did not identify with any of them. Mm. Mm -hmm. 
as I think most people would agree with, it's like, especially as a woman, they're like, here are th- these two. And then there's just so much in between. And they're like, you get to pick one. And I'm like, okay, right. I, I guess I'm the one with dandruff. Like, I'm like <laughs> yeah, at, least, at least make Alice play the flute or something. Right, put her in band or something. God. <laughs> yeah. She's like, no, I'm just a compulsive liar. So everything I've said up until this point can be discredited. And now I get a makeover. Love that. Um, but anyways, I just wanted some insider 80s perspective from Jen, who we love. Um, and Jen, for chocolate or vanilla, is there a theme this week? Um, yes, of course there's a theme, and it is just stuff from the 80s. Love the love. 80s. <laughs> um, so chocolate or vanilla? Chocolate. Vanilla. Um, chocolate. Um, and oh, so this week I put out um, ice cream toppings for the staff, and there were chocolate chips and white chocolate chips and the chocolate chips were gone and the white chocolate chips were still completely full. And I was like, Oh, chocolate or vanilla. Well, Everybody well, picked chocolate. As someone on team chocolate, I will yeah. vouch for team vanilla that white chocolate, chocolate and vanilla as a flavor are two wildly different things that should not be compared. White chocolate is not vanilla. I do white agree. chocolate. White chocolate is white chocolate. White chocolate is fucking ass. Other than if, I it's, love it. if it's with cranberries in a little macadamia nut cookie, I can turn a blind eye. On one instance. <laughs> Otherwise, don't put that shit fucking near me. I, I actually mm, no. had that exact thought. It was like, well, white chocolate isn't exactly vanilla. But so first one, leg warmers or hair scrunchies? Hair scrunchies. I love the idea of a leg warmer, but it seems kind of impractical, especially because they were always doing it like with aerobics. And I'm like, girl, those mm. are just going to get in the way. You're going to get sweaty. Were they serving a functional purpose at all? No, no, not definitely not. No, definitely not. <laughs> Yeah, the, the scrunchie, she's putting in work. She's keeping my 10 pounds of hair off the back of my neck. Yeah, the scrunchie has definitely had plenty of errors as well. Um, yeah, I'll go I'm for the scrunchie. Girl, for sure. Um, next one, denim or neon? Ooh, uh, mm-hmm. but I'm going to go with denim. I love. I will shamelessly do a Canadian tuxedo. Tuxedo? Tuxedo. I will wear a <laughs> denim jacket with jeans. I don't give a fuck. I'll put a little uh, a denim backpack, too. A jackpack. Anything. Mm. <laughs> it's a it's a durable material. It's nice. Yeah. It truly is the American classic. Um, yeah, I gotta go denim. It's timeless. I mean, I don't own enough denim, honestly. I would love to have more, but I don't feel like putting myself through the psychological torture of trying on trying jeans. Trying on jeans. So, yeah, my yeah thing, not gonna happen. I, I'm not there yet. I buy them online. Used on Depop Vintage because it's better quality because clothes that they make now just fucking suck for some reason. So Yeah, it disintegrates in your hands. Get a cute little vintage uh, online used moment. Under order on your size, obviously. Get them. They do not pull past the thighs and then learn how to sew so that you can take them out. And then now you have jeans that fit and a new skill. Um, I'd rather kill myself. <laughs> but that, ultimately, learning to sew is better than trying on jeans at Marshalls. I, I'm just going to throw that out there. Fair enough, fair enough. I'm someone that will go to, like, the Levi's store mm-hmm. to do it. Will you ask an associate for help? And they look at you and they clock you and they're like, you're a 27. And I'm like, bitch. You just looked at me. And then she's right. <laughs> I've never had that yet, but I'm sure I will. So I am going to go with neon. And uh, sometimes I like to, I wear all black a lot. And I like to put on, I have a pair of hot pink socks. And I just feel like I have a little pop of neon. <laughs> That's so cute. A little yeah. sneaky neon. I, I love that for you, Jen. <laughs> um, let's see. Next one is... Michael Jackson's leather jacket from Beat It or Prince's long purple coat from Purple Rain? Oh, Prince. I would say, I don't know if this is a hot take. Prince's fashion, more iconic than MJ's fashion. I don't know, more iconic? I think it was probably better, but but I think MJ, yeah, I think MJ probably. Yes, fair enough. Um, However, I, um, in this scenario, I'm thinking what I would wear. Um, and I'm 5'3". I can't do a long jacket like that. It just shrinks me even more. I get swallowed. So I'm going to go Michael Jackson's jacket. Right. I will, um, I think both of these are amazing, but I'm going to go with Prince's long purple jacket. Uh, next one, Phil Collins, Susu Studio, or Wham, Wake Me Up Before You Go-Go. 
Ooh, two great songs. <sighs> oh. I fucking ride or die for Phil Collins. Me, personally, <laughs> that's a god. <laughs> when you said tuxedo, I was like, oh, the studio. <laughs> Tuxedios, yeah. I, I was already thinking about it. That's how much I love Phil Collins. Put on the Tarzan soundtrack and watch me weep. <laughs> Um, I think we need a wham on this one. As much as I like Phil Collins, I don't know that I know what song you're talking about, but I certainly know Wake Me Up Before You Go Go. Okay, I'm I'm gonna go Sissu Studio. <laughs> um, next one, Footloose or Ferris Bueller? I don't love either of these, to be frank. I think Ferris Bueller is a little more iconic, and I certainly have seen it more times, so I think I'll pick that. I think I watched Footloose like once and did not ever feel the need to revisit it. I love Ferris Bueller. Um, That's like my sick movie (laughs) or like one of those comfort ones Mm -hmm. or something I put on in the back and I'm like folding laundry or doing the dishes. Um, So I'll go Ferris. Um, I will go with Footloose. I loved Footloose back in the day. Um, Hmm. Next one, uh, Princess Bride or E.T.? Two greats. Um, I have a, I have a soft spot for E.T. I love E.T. So I'm gonna have to pick that, but I do... This is this is close. And it's tough. I'm gonna go Princess Bride on this one, because I still... Like, E.T. just freaks me out. <laughs> <laughs> I love him! I don't know. He's not for me. And having not seen either of those movies until, like probably like the last two years or something like that i have no nostalgia for either um and i just <laughs> yeah he's he's just not my guy <laughs> but that little guy because he's my guy you don't <laughs> get him yeah, he's so right. have him, have him. No, you that... can kill him with a hammer and i'm gonna save him from the government okay. that's what i was trying not to say <laughs> like i relate to that stupid ass tweet that says me and my friends would have beat et with a bat <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I, I, I'm gonna go for the Princess Bride and what's his name's tiny little mustache. I will go with (laughs) E.T. Next one, Bagel Bites or Cool Ranch Doritos? Were both of these originating in the 80s? Yes, ma'am. Oh my god, iconic shit. (laughs) Iconic shit. Um, although I love a pizza bagel, especially a mini pizza bagel, very good. Where would we be as a country today without the Cool Ranch Dorito? I cannot imagine a world in which which the Cool Ranch... Yeah, especially the one at the bottom of the bag that has all the (laughs) seasoning on on it. it. Mm, that, could, and if, that could save me that could pull me from the ledge yeah. if you look close the seasoning is red and green I feel yeah it is the, yeah. the little blue dots and you're yeah. like what in the microplastics is going on here but then I'm like well I'm just gonna keep going I would actively dump out the um, the dust at the bottom of the bag and snort it if yeah. that was like the last if that was the last time I was ever gonna have Doritos like yeah um, I couldn't imagine growing up without Cool Ranch Doritos um, so definitely going to jump on that train. Yeah, me too. And when you dip them in sour cream. That's also a thing that I think only our household did, Jen, a lot, yeah. is that every that chip sounds really could good, be, though. We it's accompanied so everything with either cream cheese or sour cream. Really informed a lot of my eating habits to this day, <laughs> as I still often do both of these things. Pretzels in a cream cheese. We called it combination. <laughs> Obsessed. <laughs> Obsessed. It, and it's so good. And, you know, you can add a little hot sauce if you're feeling spicy, but just straight up pretzels and cream cheese or the Cool Ranch Doritos specifically and sour cream. Yeah, like that sounds really nachos. good. That, yeah, really. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, next one is Capri Sun or Toaster Strudels. I just had a Capri Sun the other day for like the first time in <laughs> At <the> decades. Zoo. <laughs> At the zoo, yes. No, while I was in California. And um, a Capri Sun, specifically the Pacific Cooler flavor, hits hard. I, I don't like red of anything, fruit punch too much. I, I don't really care for that. But whatever's blue, Pacific Cooler, mm. that's not even a real flavor. Nope. Blue, the concept of blue, if you can bottle that up for me, yes, it's a yes for me. <gasps> So I'll pick a Capri Sun. Oh, I think I'm going to go Pop-Tarts on this one. I, like, really grew up on Pop-Tarts. Those were, you know, if they weren't eaten before school, they were a little smushed in my bag, and I would still pick them out, like, with my little, like, mm-hmm. cupped hands and nibble on them. Um, Can I ask, across the board, what's everyone's favorite 
Pop-Tart flavor. You don't have to pick from just the originals that come in the BJ boxes. We're talking everything. You can pick s- ice cream sundae. You can pick cookie dough. You can pick the weird fucked up. They have root beer now. Love that. That shit's not okay. I'd like to try That's it. That's not okay. Um, I... If you ask... Okay, currently... Currently, I would have to say probably like a blueberry or a strawberry. Really classic. But back in the day, I was pounding the hot fudge sundae ones. Mm, s'mores for me. I hated, s'mores. hated the <gasps> s'mores ones. That's insane. Something about it. Something about like the fudge wasn't right. Mm, it, oof, no. Didn't like it. That's the wrong fudge is the secret ingredient. That's what makes it. <laughs> I, I liked the brown sugar cinnamon ones, but I would have to go I with those o- a lot. OG strawberry. And the, in my house, so sometimes my mom would get them without the frosting. And I'm like, what the hell? Like, why Bullshit. would you get them without frosting? That's a, yeah. It's still 200 calories. It's just 220 calories if it has frosting. Like, why are you robbing me of this? I remember the school lunches. Like, we were in uh, school when Michelle Obama decided to reinvigorate the school lunch program which ultimately is a good thing and i think it gets too much hate of people being like michelle obama took away french fries like please educate yourself but i remember the unfrosted pop tarts being available at lunch and i was always like are you fucking kidding me with this bullshit because now i'm not even gonna eat breakfast i would if you let me have the 20 extra grams of sugar 20 grams of sugar if you allow me 200 percent of my daily intake of sugar at 7 a.m in the morning in my little eight-year-old body go to hell (laughs) i don't remember that yeah, they started, they were unfrosted. And in the vending machines at our high school, they put the fucking unfrosted ones in there. And I was like, fuck you. But I also loved a Capri Sun. This is the last one. Uh, Running Up That Hill by Kate Bush or Crazy Train, Ozzy Osbourne. I have a, well, not to be like hashtag not like other girls, but I have a p- particular gripe that Stranger <laughs> Things decided to use Running Up That Hill as their Kate Bush song of choice to bring back to the cultural zeitgeist. Love yes. that for Miss Kate. It should have been Wuthering Heights. I know it made sense in the context of the season or whatever, and that, sure. the, that the lyrics resonated with the character development. I don't give a fuck. Wuthering Heights is the superior Kate Bush song by a fucking mile. And nobody's nobody's willing to say it, but I am here on the swamp. Hot takes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what, what what's the name of the guys who make the fucking Stranger Things show? Fuck you. Fuck fuck Stranger Things. Don't watch well, the new season. Stranger, no. Fuck, fuck Stranger fuck, Things in general. Fuck Stranger Things for way bigger reasons than what I am addressing. Uh, but mostly they didn't pick the Kate Bush song that I like more to feature. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm still gonna pick. I'm still gonna pick uh, running up that hill because it's still. I love me some Kate Bush. <laughs> yeah, I would actively listen to running up that hill um i would never choose to put on crazy train so i think that's all that needs to be said i will pick crazy train because it was my earworm the other day and i just couldn't get it out of my head fair enough i remember loving that one on guitar hero as a as a child Mm, good one yeah yeah so jen thank you for your 80s insights on specific matters oh i did have one more question about molly ringwald specifically and her (laughs) fashion choices was the way she dressed was not common correct she was sort of a the way she was dressing was that quintessentially 80s or was she doing something a little quirky and different was she a trailblazer was she yeah the person people were emulating i would say like they were trying to say, like, oh, she had more money than the average girl. Like, but even just the way she dresses across a lot of the movies she was in at that time, I feel like she's always kind of in, like, vintage, a little more, like, old ladyish style clothes, <laughs> usually to convey that she's, like, pure and good or whatever. But I was like, is she sort of, was she sort of a style icon, I wonder? Or again, is it more retrospectively people use her as a style icon now when referencing the 80s, but really in the 80s, people weren't dressing like that. You know, yeah, that was my I, question. I would, I would agree with you hmm. as far as, like, you look back and you say that was 80s, but it wasn't super 80s. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like uh, if we had live yeah. footage of like a high school or something, like nobody was fucking dressing like that. I guess yeah. that's true of all movies, though. Anyways, yeah. just wanted I did to have a, pick your brain. A phase where I wore pencil skirts and like high heels to school. Like, I think everyone yeah. had sort of a doing yeah. too much in high school phase for yeah. sure. That's very common. 
Mm -hmm. I certainly was whipping out some wedges when I needed to be hoofing up four flights of stairs a day. And I'd be thinking to myself, girl, girl, invest in some sneakers. (laughs) It's like, yeah, full beat. Not Mm -hmm. demure. Oh, yeah. Not mindful. Yeah, why why was I putting a full phase of foundation on? I have not done that since probably my junior year. Yeah. But anyways, Jen, thank you for being here. We love you. Thank you for chocolate or vanilla. And we will see you next week. All right, I love you guys. Have an awesome night. Love you too. Bye. Bye. I did not know until now that Molly Ringwald was 16 when they shot this. And, of course, I never really put too much thought into it, and I sort of, from a 2024 perspective, always assume that everyone in teen high school movies is 35, right? So it actually was kind of jarring to learn the ages. Like, I say, like, Judd Nelson being 26 is high, but, like, legit, they have 35-year-olds playing high schoolers sometimes, so, like, 26 is... I think Grease. Yeah, 26 is not that offensive. um, Yeah, all of Glee. (laughs) Ali Shady and Emilio Estevez are at the same age, and they were both around 22 when this filmed, uh, Mm -hmm. and Anthony Michael Hall and Molly Ringwald are the same age, and they were both around 16, uh, 16, 17, you know, when this filmed. And I was looking into this, and I didn't know too much about Molly Ringwald as a celebrity, as an actress, other than that she was this very iconic 80s character character. So I sort of looked into it a little bit and and I found some quite interesting articles that she herself wrote around the 2017 time, the the sort of launch of the Me Too movement. She um, sort of put out these articles explaining, I guess she had sort of a hiatus from Hollywood for a while after this very iconic era of her playing these young women in 80s movies. And then she sort of left and she moved to France and she got married and she wasn't acting a ton. Really? Yeah. Well, I just knew her from Secret Life of the American Teenager. Well, and so then, you know, a little bit older as an adult, she comes back and now she's in stuff all the time. She's in The Bear. She's in a, a lot of TV shows. She's very... She's a working actress. Yeah, she plays the AA. She plays the AA leader. She's only in a couple episodes, but when Carmi goes to like AA to understand his brother more, she's like the yeah. I was like, oh, clock clocked Molly Ringwald. Uh, But yeah, she's she's working. She's doing fine as far as I can tell. But I was reading these articles that she had wrote and. The relationship between her and John Hughes, while not explicitly inappropriate, is certainly something kind of weird about it because he... It feels sinister. So he wrote the script of The Breakfast Club and he pitched it and they were like, sure, let's start some like test casting. And he sees a photo of Molly Ringwald and immediately then writes the script of 16 Candles because he's like, I need to meet that girl in that picture because I just wrote a movie about her. Weird weird behavior to me. I hate that. And he's like, yeah, you just, like, look like a bitch whose uh, family would forget her birthday. Like, like what a fucking weird what, <laughs> what a weird thing. Like, yeah, I saw your picture and I just, Jesus I Christ, knew yeah. that everyone would be forgetting your birthday. But uh-huh, so he sort uh-huh. of, he finds her, right? And, and then that movie gets made first. And he, yeah. she becomes sort of his muse. And she openly admits that their working relationship was fairly professional. It was very father-daughter. But she was sure. his muse in a way because he then proceeded to have her be at the front of his first three big movies. And, yeah. and that's why this whole sort of John Hughes speaking on behalf of the uncomfortable teen girl community is a, is a little bit odd to me. And he sort of did the same thing with Anthony Michael Hall as well, because he sort of got him mm-hmm. roped in and, and he also sort of served as yeah, this... he's also in 16 Candles. Yeah, and, he served you know, as this he... muse kind of character to be the catalyst for the misunderstood geeky guy, which John Hughes obviously yeah. kind of had a little bit of himself like right, yeah. in there. But then when both of those actors wanted to move on, of course, because by that point, they're like, I'm entering my 20s. I did these high school movies when I was 16, 17, 18. Let's start doing adult shit. Uh, And maybe I want to work with a director who's not you. John, love ya, but let's, Mm -hmm. I'm a working actor. He fucking, he, something happened and they didn't get work, right? Because he felt this weird ownership over them, which this is not explicitly in writing anywhere, but this is incredibly what it seems like, right? Because they say to him, Mm. I want to move on which a good mentor-mentee relationship is like, yes, I want to help you. Yes, of course. Let's get you in auditions. Yes, I put you, uh, like, I've built you up. Mm -hmm. I've gotten you this far. This is what I can do for you. Let's push you beyond this. Or, John, even, how about you just write a movie about adults, right? 
take these two kids and be like, oh, let's write, uh, let's do, let's do a uh, St. Elmo's Fire. Crazy. Right? Let's, let's do something about people who are age appropriate for you. But I guess Anthony Michael Hall was offered the role of Ferris Bueller and he was like, no, I, I'm ready to do other things. And really had so much trouble getting work because he, they both like, you know, quote unquote wronged John Hughes. And now they couldn't sure. get work, so... And then, um... Well, that's so nasty. Yeah. Also, I couldn't imagine Anthony Michael Hall playing Ferris Bueller. No, no. So it would be a completely God. different movie. Yeah. Insane. Maybe Cameron, but Jesus Christ. Um, but I also, in those articles, she also details her experience working with Harvey Weinstein, and she also details several instances of being sexually assaulted on Hollywood sets in her young days huh. as an actress. Of course. She's like, yeah. I'm sure. She's like, yeah, me and everyone else. She's like, now I'm just publishing it in The New Yorker because I feel like I should. And specifically, yeah. she talks about showing her 10-year-old daughter this movie. I'll post the link to the article in the description because it was actually a fairly interesting read as someone who didn't know a lot about mm-hmm. like the culture and the history surrounding yeah, her in this absolutely. movie. But she, her 10-year-old daughter was like, hey, all my friends have seen it. And you're in it. And she's like, your 10-year-old friends have seen that movie. Like, it's kind of adult. But she's like, I guess if we watch it together yeah. and I'm there to sort of explain things to you, like, sure. sure. She's like, yeah, as I was watching it with my daughter, she's like, I hadn't really revisited or, like, thought about it a ton since I'd made it. But she's like, but watching it with my daughter, I thought to myself, like, a lot of this shit in this movie is really not chill. <laughs> like, it's fucked up. It's, like, yeah. not really a cool thing. And she was, like, remembering the way that being on set made her feel really uncomfortable with, like, the upskirt panty shot. She's like, even though they had a body double be the the panties, even somebody pretending to be me in that scenario made me, as a teen, so uncomfortable. And I could imagine that. Imagine you're 16, they're like, yeah, Absolutely. we're gonna bring in this 30-year-old uh, in a thong to do the upskirt shot that's supposed to be you. Of course, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, everyone's, like, even if it's not her, everyone's projecting that. Mm-hmm. Of you know? course, yes. Of course. And she said, she's like, yeah, my daughter asked me, and I and I talked to her about it, and then we sort of just moved on, but it reminded me of how uncomfortable it made me feel as a 16-year-old. That's extremely uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Which is... That's like the, which is why I mean I, I can complain so much about 35-year-olds playing high schoolers, but ultimately I do think, like, let's, you know, not don't make kids work 50-hour days and do weird shit and you can you can just have eighteen year olds playing sixteen year olds. That's fine. Even, That's probably even like a little sleazy then. Yeah. But you know what I mean. Even tw- twenty two. Emilio Estevez. He looked too old. But I'll give it a pass. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh God. Oh my. Can can we talk about his performance? Yeah, it's bad. <laughs> it's really bad. It's really bad. Um, he plays it in a way that. Um, it's like the acting that someone actually does in their high school play. I wrote down that this... It's exactly that. That this feels like a video, this whole movie, almost at any given moment, you could take a clip and play it to a health class. And you play it and then you pause and you say, okay, kids, so we're going to break down this interaction. What should Claire have said? Right, here's an example of the Uh wrong way to do this. But the way that they're acting sometimes is like, hey, I'm bullying you. Oh no! Oh, absolutely! I'm a victim, and then like pause, and like a little cartoon of like a tiger yeah. pops up, and it's like it's here's to- what could have happened. It felt very like high school health class anti bullying seminar acting level it's from him. A total after school special, mm-hmm. entirely, entirely. Um, yeah, I also just want to throw in that it's absolutely psychotic that Andrew admitted to being like, yeah, I just beat this kid up because I kind of felt like it. (laughs) Um, Honestly, I feel like the- Absolutely. Mind you, mind you, this is the second most psychotic thing, (laughs) um, because the first psychotic thing, um, in my opinion, is him hotboxing, um, a room to himself, smoking weed, um, and he ends up running around, semi dancing, semi doing gymnastics, all around the top of the library, which is the last thing that you would ever want to do after just like facing a joint to yourself. In my opinion, well, in my opinion, it was give. In my opinion, it was giving um, that performance that Al Pacino gave in cruising where he does poppers and he kind of like starts acting like he's having a seizure like he just did like an insane amount of co- like you could just tell like he he didn't know what poppers did <laughs> this it's the same it's the same performance let al pacino you know, like, do you poppers never, you, get I'm like, him oh, some you, poppers for yeah. real <laughs> 
That's what you need yeah. to go method Emilio, on. Do the drug for the, real. Well, Emilio, right? Emilio Estevez, I don't, or John Hughes has never smoked weed in his life, if this is what he's writing. Uh, no, I think that that man was ripping fat lines. I think that that man, <laughs> I think he was in the coke riddle days of the 80s, and he doesn't even remember <laughs> writing the scripts to any of these movies. Um, hmm. He's dead, so we can say whatever we want about him. Uh, <laughs> yeah, fine. Rest, rest in <laughs> peace, works, rest yeah. in peace, John Hughes. I don't really know. I, my opinion, uh, <laughs> n- not so much. I'll just say, I'll just, I'll, I'll just say, rest, rest, rest. He's, John Hughes, he's resting. That's that's a fact. <laughs> you came here for facts. That is a fact that John Hughes is dead. Um, <laughs> Um, I thought you were yeah, going to say no, the, that the most it, the most wild thing because all the kids in this very touching moment they they all smoke the saddest little personal joints of probably the worst skunk <laughs> weed the, the most mid weed uh, ever they all and then they're suddenly like well now we understand each other because we're all going to pretend to be high because you're not high <laughs> like none of those kids actually no. in that situation none of those kids are yeah he did not have enough smoke from that sad baby joint to hotbox the computer lab sir yeah. Exactly. But I thought they all then decide to reveal what they did to get put in there. And that's sort of the big yes. the big deep conversation moment where we're gonna, yes, we're gonna exactly. all sit in a circle and, and really get down to the uh-huh. nitty gritty. We're, we're gonna really understand we're gonna, each yeah. other. Yeah, we're gonna expose ourselves, but then we're also gonna wrap it back around to we don't like our parents. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they all dads specifically. Da- dad issues all dads. across the board. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh Brian's mom seemed also kind of not chill, right? We saw her in the car with the sister for, like, a hot second, I think. Yeah. Right. But also, I feel like that's something that, like, it was a pretty reasonable portrayal of, like, She's like the you way need, suburban mom. You is need this to the study. first time or the last... Yeah. Is this, is this the first time or the last time we're gonna do this? Yeah. Right. Like, yeah, come that's... On. Come on. I would whip that one out. If I had a kid who was acting up, I would... That's just kind of a classic. Exactly. It's kind of fire. <laughs> but... Uh, fucking Andrew is like, yeah, I just, uh, fucking beat this kid up and literally like beat, yeah, I beat this guy to a pulp within an inch of his life and, and all my friends saw, thought it was hilarious. And the whole time I was like, my yeah. dad is going to love this. And I, I also, sex- and by the way, I also sexually assaulted him. Mm-hmm. So, yep. And now, uh, in retrospect, I think that was maybe not cool. And everyone's like, yeah, man, not cool. And they all sort of move on. <laughs> Okay, but then, but then, Anthony Michael, Hall, Anthony Michael Hall is like, yeah, one hub, I brought a gun to school. Uh, <laughs> a wild, a wild thing to just drop out of nowhere. I am obsessed uh-huh. that in 1980, it's it was a flare gun, but I'm still going to call it sure. a firearm. It's a firearm. Yeah. This this teenager brought a it firearm. It does shoot fire. It, it went off in his locker, and that's why yeah. he was in Saturday school, but... Mm-hmm. He brought a gun to school and got Saturday school, whereas the opening sequence of this film showing us this gorgeous school they go to, beautiful library, yeah, so jealous. They're all complaining. Uh-huh. I'm like, you all clearly live in an affluent ass area because this this yeah. public school yeah, is Chicago. phenomenal. Uh, but he's like, th- they're showing the school and they show a computer lab and it says hackers will be expelled. I love that. <laughs> so eighties. If you try to hack in the computer lab. Don't even think about it. You're out of here, bucko. But if mm-hmm. you bring a firearm to school, that is a Saturday school. That's just yeah. one Don't detention. Don't worry about it. That's one detention. Don't worry about it. I mean, it's that. that's basically still the rule today, so. Well, no. Because <laughs> when we had bomb threats at our school, all the kids who had drugs in their lockers, do you remember all of them yeah. going to try to flush their shit? Because they're yeah. like, they're getting the bomb dogs in here. And we're all like, you idiots, the bomb dogs can't smell weed. Yes, they can. <laughs> Everyone was like, no, don't worry about it. The, the dogs are sniffing for bombs, not for weed. You're going to be fine, man. What the hell? Mm-hmm. What? Yeah. Lo- no, I, love, I do remember that. I love America. That was crazy. We did ha- yeah, we did have a bomb threat in high school. It was like, a- I remember that very mm-hmm. vividly. Yeah, I was in Spanish to- class. I'm, uh, and unfortunately, yeah. I think this that is something that too many people can relate to going to school in America. Oh, yeah. That sort of normalized, like that shouldn't be a thing. Um, but... Mm-hmm. But yeah, I was well, like, yeah, I, sh- I, sh- I shouldn't have to practice lockdown drills for when Anthony Michael Hall brings a gun to school. Oh my god, when he brings, I'm like, why were you gonna do it in front of everyone? Like, let's extrapolate on that, buddy. Right? What, why would why was the school the location? You, you know who had a better plan than him? Becky and Glee. Oh my god, <laughs> stop! 
Is this going to become a Glee podcast at some point, honestly? Eventually. I mean, we should probably do a, a bonus episode mm-hmm. for Glee there, eventually. There's a Glee which... movie, but it's like the live concert movie, so it's not nearly uh, as yeah, good. I don't care for that. We could no, do... No, I think, I think... If anyone out there wants us to cover a specific episode of Glee, message us the season and episode number, and I will highly consider. Mm-hmm. If you're like... If you really want us to do, like, the Willy Wonka one, that one will make me cry, actually. I don't... I would... We'll be sobbing. Oh, sobbing. Fuck. Oh, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'll do Britney, Britney. Yeah, if you I'll guys easily like, do Britney, Britney. We really want you guys to do the blame it on the alcohol episode. I'll be like, all right, you got oh! me. All right, you Literally got me. Literally the best. Literally the best. Weird, weird fun fact, weird lore is that our middle school music teacher, his daughter was on the first season of the Glee Project, and she like mm-hmm. came to our school a couple she of times. Hurt. And she, yeah, yeah she, she came in like far. third or fourth or something um and she would like come around to like sign all the show choir kids fucking shit because she was on the glee project she didn't win though oh, yeah. I, don't, I don't know what she did after but her like youngest brother time. was like close to our age and i was like that's crazy your, your older sister yeah. was involved in that wild mm-hmm. the 2000s wild yeah. times man mm-hmm. um can i ask you what you think about the stupid ass song hey you can always you can already infer that i hate it i hate it yeah well because it's a bad song i hate almost everything about this movie and i also just hate uh, when people tell me that i have to like something that they're like hey you've never seen this but you have to see it first of all fuck you i don't have to see anything Hmm. Uh, but but i like to talk about shit right so maybe i'll watch it for cultural conversation points right but don't tell me i have to like it now i'm not gonna like it and i actually i like to reverse participate in that this by doing this exact thing to other people so that they will hate watch and then hate something because sometimes hating something is as fun as liking something i'm a hater i'll say it sometimes i'll tell people i'm like oh my god you have to watch it and you you have to like it Objectively, it's horrible. Objectively, oh. objectively, you have to like it. And I'm like, you're going to go home and you're going to fucking hate this shit because I told you you have to like it. <laughs> because when I'm told I have to like something, I'm like, guess what? Now I'm going to hate it even more. You are very much that. You do that with TV a lot. Well, yes. What does that say? Yeah. Now let's uh, let's smoke a baby joint and, and just get down to the real shit. Let's talk about how my dad is really the source of this problem. No, I'm fucking chill with my dad. I don't like... I would be normal as fuck. I would Shouts be Anthony Michael Gary. Hall. Shouts out, Gary. I would be Anthony Michael Hall. I'd be like, guys, we have an essay due. We have a thousand words. <laughs> Yeah. This assignment, this principal, who is a problematic figure, why do all in itself, why yeah. do all adults have to be like such bumbling idiots in order for the teens to like be uplifted to get their mm-hmm. revenge? I'm like, he doesn't have to be that dumb, but yeah, I guess we do have the wise janitor as sort of a foil, right? We have sure. evil vice principal, what's well, yeah, his name, like whatever, Mister Miyagi, and then like chill, chill janitor guy, uh, which yeah. is kind of nice. Like Stan, I think. Carl. Think that was his name? Carl, Carl, it was Carl. Carl, the chill janitor who I will be marrying Mm -hmm. in Fuck Mary Kill later. Uh, Um, Of course. What was I saying? No idea. Bumbling idiots. Uh, Not sure. Um, can I interject though? Oh, that this no, that this assignment that he gives them, right? He uh, oh, yes. at the very beginning, he's like, "You're going to be here for nine hours for some reason." He's like, "You're going to be here uh, all day, and I just need you to write a thousand words." And what's the prompt? Like, who do you think you are, or some vague yeah, bullshit you like tell that? Tell me who you think you are, or something. And I'm sure from a teacher's perspective, that's like the most basic ass. What did you do on your summer vacation? essay prompt right literally gives me mm-hmm. a thousand words to prove that you know how to write competent sentences and that's gonna be sure. good enough and at the end they're like we're all gonna go make out and the nerd is gonna write the essay for us Th- reinforcing that we didn't learn anything in this movie and he yeah. writes this fucking hashtag owned ass essay where he's like this is mm-hmm. who we really transcended boundaries today and i'm like this guy yeah, you're, wants you're only a thousand gonna see words. us how you want to see us i'm like this motherfucker was looking for like i live at this address with my parents i have a sister uh like who <laughs> i think i am let's get down brass tacks right basic basic ass yeah. facts this is what he's looking for not a nobody was asking you to have a psychological breakthrough today sure it's just attention did you ever ha- did you ever get in trouble in school I got suspended at the very oh. end of senior year. Well, yes, I meant like I meant like detention type trouble, but no. Did they even give out detention in our school? We had in school suspension. 
And yeah, then we also, we that. I don't know if I was never close enough to trouble to know if we had Saturday school, but I know you also had summer school, but that was more for the kids who didn't <laughs> yeah. pass. That was less of a... Yeah, I didn't do good enough on MCAST, and they sent me to Saturday school, mm-hmm. like, my freshman year, I think. It's more of an academic thing um, than a behavior thing, for sure. Exactly. Yeah, I... Well, no, because I was, I was so good Yeah. right up until the end. Yeah. And then they said... <laughs> You're drunk at prom, and I said, yes, I am. Yes, ma'am. Um, <laughs> yes, sir. My, my husband got sent his freshman year, our freshman year, we were all in high school together, um, he uh-huh. got sent to in-school suspension, which was just a room that Why? you sat in, because he and a friend were, like, fake play fighting, and a teacher took it very seriously, and they, bo- they both were really? like, no, we were just play fighting. They're like, this is not something to be. So this was something that he then had to... Why does this feel like the psych teacher? Right. No, it wasn't her, but I know who you're talking about. It could have been. Um, and he got sent, and he then had to explain on his college applications. It was like, if your transcript indicates any in-school suspensions, please extrapolate on that now. And he had to, like, write... That's crazy. He had to write fucking a thousand words of, like, this was the situation. Please do not penalize me for it. It was a misunderstanding, and I was also 14 years old. And now I'm offering to give you a lifetime's debt worth of money to, you know, go to your educational institution. Please forgive me. So weird. I I remember him asking me, like, hey, like, how do you think I should word this? And me being like, this is weird as fuck. That they're like, please justify this trouble you got in the one time. Uh, But he had to go to in-school suspension, which was just for the rest of the school day. You sit in a room with a teacher, and you do do nothing. They were like, you can read or do homework, but don't talk. And that was it. And I was like, yeah, that seems accurate, I guess. So strange. Yeah, very very odd. Um, Yeah, no, I I never got any of that. Um, uh, I did want to ask, if you think that we have a movie that will sort of be... Almost equivalent to this, where it's very culturally referenced and, um, I don't know, not as good as people think it is. Um, Yeah, you posed this to me earlier, and honestly, I think my understanding of this question has shifted since our conversation with Jen um, before Chocolate or Vanilla, where she sort of got into that from her perspective as an 80s teen, was that this movie Mm -hmm. was not, like, hitting, that this wasn't, like, a breakthrough cultural moment until a little later, where it was more, yeah, like a nostalgia thing, right? It was like, oh, like, this movie really did capture. So I don't think you can identify Mm -hmm. a classic until it's already there. Yeah, that's the hard thing, because I I thought, I assumed that this was, like, popular from the jump. Yeah, me too. that made me, that made me assume, I... My answer for this was going to be Barbie. Oh. But I feel like I have to retract that. But I also think Barbie is already a reference of something, right? Whereas this movie exactly, was exactly. an original that was doing something, I will admit, has a lot of great mm-hmm. moments that can be easily parodied. This movie is about yeah. 50-50 movie to montage. You could watch this movie yeah. in two segments. The first is the film without montages. That's 35 minutes. Then it only the montages. And it's another 35 minutes. And they fucking knew what they yeah. were doing. Because anyone can parody that shit. You have any group of five people, and you have them dancing funny. And, and you Easy have, money. And it's the Breakfast Club reference, right? It's sort of the TikTok of today of, like, doing something that other people can emulate in a way that's yeah. instantly recognizable. Um, which I think is really hard. And I think that's sort of the key to a lot of important or popular media now yeah. is like what can be easily reproduced and copied Reference, to yeah. make uh yeah sort of re- quote unquote like relatable so i don't really know sure. it's hard to say and you know you think about teen movies now like i think like first one that comes to mind is like bottoms right is bottoms yeah. gonna be this like queer cult classic or will it fizzle out i don't know i have no concept i don't think yeah, anyone knows um Fair enough. I just know what I like and what I don't like. But I, I did, I will commend this movie for, I think, all the chase sequence and dancing sequence. At one point, I'm like, didn't we already see this? Didn't we already see them dance? And I'm like, mm-hmm. I, I'm, I don't even know where I am anymore. How many it's montages can we do? Yeah. But hey, uh-huh. because when I saw Victorious and I was <laughs> yeah. 12 or whatever and watched that episode mm-hmm. of Victorious, I had never even seen The Breakfast Club, but I fucking knew no. what they were referencing. I knew oh, yeah. the cultural touch point that they were, that is how ubiquitous that this, you know, movie became. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I really have no idea of, of what could grow to that point. I'm interested to see. Also, with the sort of uh, shortening of the cultural attention span, how soon will yeah. the turnover, you know, the turnover of something in made in the 80s, 
then gets a little more iconic in the 90s, redone and rebooted and culturally referenced to death to the point where it's then no longer relevant by the 2010s. That's like a good 30 year span of time right now. Do we get that whole cycle in like a couple of years now? Maybe. I don't know. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. I, I also I don't know. Because the, the, the thing that I could say, like at this point that has become sort of cult classic, the closest thing to a cult classic for us, I think is Jennifer's body. Maybe like mo- like most recently made, yeah, cult most classic. Recent, like mm-hmm. yes, yeah, yeah, like the yeah, perhaps. So I I, I also think that there is this sort of modern, uh, less of a cultural grasp and understanding surrounding the humor of satire and parody. I think a lot mm. of people now again, with the shortened attention span, that things have to be presenting themselves at face value to people all the time in order to be noticed. And so things like satire and and parody that are a little more subtle or have more layers to it, or, you know, you have to have some sort of deeper reading or understanding to really get the joke. I think that's being lost on a lot of people. I think that style of comedy Mm -hmm. is really fizzling out, which is really unfortunate because I think that's some of the funniest shit. That's some of the the best kind of comedy and i see Mm -hmm. more attempts at it are being less and less good nowadays um i don't really know where that stems from other than just like the jimmy fallon yeah i guess the the late night talk show (laughs) it's jimmy fallon's fault on all of it i just hold him personally responsible for most things Mm -hmm. so but i think a lot of people now don't understand like sarcasm and you think you understand sarcasm because you're like Oh, yeah, I'm saying like Ryan Reynolds, right? Ryan Reynolds is Deadpool, I think is the perfect example of what people consider to be a sarcastic character. I need that man shot. (laughs) Uh, Don't even get me started with the it ends with us press tour drama. drama. I'm I'm obsessed with how messy they are. I love that people are starting to think that they're sinister because we've been saying that shit for years now. They are sinister. Plantation wedding? Plantation. Slugs. But I think the Marvel Marvel humor, (laughs) the Marvel humor of it all is people think now that like Tony Stark being like, (laughs) yeah, you bet I'm a billionaire philanthropist playboy. They think that that is like sarcasm and that's not what that is, Right. There's just a fundamental no. misunderstanding and shift in, like, that sort of style of humor, um, which yeah. I think pa- then affects parody, right? People parodying stuff, yeah. which I think was an important part of the legacy of The Breakfast Club, is how often it got parodied. So if we're no longer uh, effectively making parody of stuff, then it doesn't get remembered as much because we're no longer referencing exactly. it. So that's my, that's my, I hate The Breakfast Club, but I love Victoria Justice. Yeah. I Can love we Victoria play? Justice. We could play Fuck Mary Kill. We could do the vice principal, the janitor, and janitor. then the abstract concept of any of their parents who we hear about through a lot of dialogue but don't really see. Because, like, I'm going to kill Bender's dad, obviously. I'm sure that guy sucks. Sure. Yeah. Or I could, like, I could. That's another thing that I felt like all of these kids were missing is the fundamental grasp of when somebody is mean to you and is like, are you a virgin? Tell me you're a virgin. Be like, no, I'm not. I fuck your mom. You know, just be, be yeah. aggressive back. back to the aggressor. Back. I, that's another thing I felt uh, disconnect with the 80s of, especially coming from Claire, the like more demure of like, I'm not going to give you the satisfaction <laughs> of a response. I'm just going to turn my nose up and look away. Whereas sure. I'm like, I think we need to be teaching the modern girl to be like, Fuck you, I fucked your mom. Don't fucking ask about me, you fucking piece of shit creep. Yeah, make exactly. them Make them feel weird for bringing it up. Just own, don't mm-hmm. act embarrassed. Just be like, why are you trying to make me feel embarrassed? That's weird of you, right? That's what you should be pulling on yeah. Bender, Claire. That's mm-hmm. what I see for you. Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah we, I'll kill let's Andrews. Not, we don't even need to play Fuck, Mary Kill that. I'll marry the cool yeah. janitor. I'll kill everyone's parents with uh, the yeah, flare sure. gun. <laughs> Sure. Oh, speaking um, of killing people, this is not uh, chill, but I I was interested. I was like, it wouldn't it be a fun so a little segment if for the movie we watched, I found the most disgusting fan fiction. Just the most raunchy, <laughs> off the beaten path shit. I, and I was like, and what if I read a little segment? I'm like, that could be really fun, right? And so I I'm go, sure this is there's plenty of this. Well, you'd think, right? But no, only normies write fanfiction about The Breakfast Club because I go on to fanfiction.net and I try nothing gay, 
only about the heterosexual no only about the heterosexual couples established in the film. I was trying to find some like Anthony Michael Hall and Judd Nelson fan fiction about like yeah. the the freak what and the that? nerd. Yeah. I was like, oh, let me find something raunchy about them like fucking in the broom closet to like pull a, a segment <laughs> from, just because I thought it would be funny. Could not find sure. a scrap, and it was almost all of the fan fictions. Because who's wasting their time on this dog shit? All of them were about what if Anthony Michael Hall's character then later does kill himself, and they all have to attend his funeral later, and they have to reconnect and rekindle their friendship at his funeral. I was like, what is this premise? No, let's let the boy live. Let him go to college. Let him go to MIT or something. Why does he have to always be killing you himself? You can watch that movie. That movie's called The Big Chill, and I would say that's the follow up to this. Well, yeah. Film, personally. I think The Big Chill is a fantastic movie, um, especially for the 80s. Um, and freaking young Jeff Goldblum, Jesus Christ. Um, love that movie. Love that soundtrack. Um, and we're going to be tentatively, I think, covering it on the Patreon. Yeah, shouts so, out to our we'll own Patreon. Out. Follow the link in the description below for $2.86. We're going to talk about The Big Chill, which I've never seen and you really like. So I'm excited to do mm-hmm. that. And we're going to talk about Hot D. I know season two finale yes. was a while ago, but I still want to talk about it. So we're going to talk a I've little... still got plenty to say. We're still going to do a little Hot D episode for mm-hmm. y'all. So if you want to check that out. They're, neither of those are out mm-hmm. yet, but they will uh, this month. If you want to subscribe to the Patreon. Also, if you want to see my Copybara shirt that I'm wearing from the San Diego mm-hmm. Zoo, we post the video mm-hmm. versions of these uh, on the Patreon as well. Not to do all my wrap-up stuff already, because regularly scheduled programming. What are... Oh, you said what you were going to follow it up with. I My answers were pretty bad. I think you should watch the Victorious episode. This really Not made... This made me want to revisit the episode of Victorious that basically one-to-one parallels this entire movie. I think brilliant. Yeah. Uh, my other answer was Pitch Perfect, because they, mm. they have a big Breakfast Club referential song moment uh in that sure. movie and i find that movie to be a lot more bearable than this one which is saying a lot because it's a movie about that college acapella plenty. a movie about college yeah. acapella is more tolerable to me than this uh so yeah that yeah speaks volumes um and what are you gonna eat and drink uh so with I, this film? I was like if you're gonna have a party for this awful movie you have to be balling hard and so mm. then I, they don't even eat breakfast They eat lunch. So I was like, what did they all bring for lunch? And I'm like, you could get a high-end spread based on what everyone has. But then I was like, no, it's the breakfast club. So what if we, like, breakfastified everyone's lunch? So Mm -hmm. Allison, she does that weird shit where she, like, pours the pixie sticks onto the sandwich and, like, crushes it with some Captain Crunch and stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't know about all that, but I know the Australians have something called fairy toast, which is when you, like, put sugar yes. on, like, a toast. But I, I also think you could just elevate that to, like, a, a decadent French toast, a cinnamon sugary Absolutely. toast, right? So we're going there with that. Uh, Sexy. Uh, Andrew's eating, like, a turkey, like, six turkey sandwiches or something. Course, I just think yeah. we're, we're banging out. He would want a bacon, egg, and cheese on, like, a on a big, fat roll, nice. like a bulky roll. Just a, bulky roll. Like a, a dummy thick egg sandwich for Andrew. Yeah. Uh... It's, what's his name? Anthony Michael Hall's lunch didn't really stand out to me, but he had soup. Um, so what is breakfast soup but orange juice? So we're gonna throw <laughs> that into the mix, I guess. Huh. And then Claire's lunch was sushi. Um, sushi. And then what is breakfast ba- sushi? I don't know. Bagel and lox. Bagel and lox. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. You, you phoned mm-hmm. that in for me. And then uh, I think you should Got also... You. Everyone at the party gets the saddest skinniest individually uh, rolled joint of the worst skunk weed that you can find. You are not getting this from a dispensary. You are getting this from an alleyway. And you're and, yeah. and you're gonna smoke Someone's them inside. Brother. You're gonna smoke them inside and no one's gonna get high. And that's what I think you should do uh, exactly. uh, while you watch yeah. your victorious episode, I guess. What about you for food and you drink? Not bad. Um again I took um I referenced the lunch scene and I had to sit back and think, what did I bring for lunch in middle school, high school Mm. type thing? Um, And I think that you can easily play off of that. For me, I remember very distinctly, um, probably in like the eighth grade, it was around the time that Nutella 
boom popping off popped off popped Mm -hmm. off um yeah it was a whole big thing and i remember vividly i would go this isn't a lunch i don't know who (laughs) thought this was okay for me to bring this to sustain myself um for like six plus hours after the day because i was doing after school activities i would just put nutella on some tortillas And call it a day. Mm-hmm. Roll and it up. It. Roll that it up it. like that sad little joint that you're about to smoke inside the library. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, to this but, day, so, I'll run. I'll run a fucked up tortilla to this day because of the habits I built in middle school. Cream yeah. cheese on a tortilla, rolled up real tight in a pinch. Mm-hmm. It gets the job done. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so I, I was thinking, you know, how can I elevate that? Crepes. That's just a crepe. Yes. It's a crepe. Love. And guess what? That's a, and that's a fabulous breakfast meal. Um, yeah. So I think you make like a really nice stack of like mm. sexy Nutella crepes. Um, and I was thinking about what I drank in high school, um, liquor wise, which was just Fedka and like lemonade or something. Um, I think you just make yourself a screwdriver because Ugh. a mimosa is not strong enough for this movie. Mm-hmm. When and the, so. the the true fallacy of this film was not making Allison actually we like everything she said was a lie. So she's like, I drink vodka and I'm hard. But I'm like, that girl in high school was drinking vodka and she was yeah. going hard. Like, I believe. Oh yeah. I, I believe women, and I believe Allison. Yeah, And even if absolutely. she says it's not true, I know that that girl has a warm bottle of Absolute under her bed because her and I were friends, okay? Mm-hmm. Yep, yep, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> friends, yeah. Um, and where are you going to give this movie? I'm going to give it a two. <laughs> uh, I'll give it a four. I'm a hater. I love to be a hater. Um, iconically... Uh, even if it's just for the bit, even if I'm hating it more because hating it makes people mad, mm-hmm. that makes me want to hate it more. Um, maybe that's performative of me. I don't care. I don't like this movie. I don't like John Hughes. If you think yeah, that's okay, enough. I'm sorry you just had to listen to us yap. Uh, but also, thank you for staying this long. As I was going on my rant about uh, sarcasm and the misunderstanding of a lot of humor, I-, I think a lot of it comes from the length of conversation that can be had on social media effectively. Mm-hmm. And I sometimes don't think that TikTok or Twitter or whatever is an effective place to actually talk about shit because you just have to say the most aggressive, eye-catching thing first and at the top to get your shit out there, right? Which isn't always the best way to talk about stuff. So thank you for being here an hour into a podcast where, not to say we talked about anything uh, effective or important today, but I just enjoyed this a lot more than I enjoy feeling like I'm being bombarded with really intense shit all the time. So Hmm. thanks for being here, friends. I love you all. Swamp Nation. We don't really have a name for Swamperts. I was trying to make Swamperts happen for a yeah. while, but I don't mm-hmm. think so. We can't do Swamp Nation because I feel like Brittany Broski has Broski Nation. And if anyone has a good name for Swamp listeners, let me know. Yeah, something. Three years into it, I don't know what to call you guys. Just my besties, yeah. honestly. You're the, here. The yeah. homies. Our friends. Thank you um, for being here. We love you. Thank you for sticking around for 80s month. And next week will be another movie from the 80s, believe it or not. Yeah. Goodbye and good night. <laughs>